This episode is brought to you by the Redline Report by Brand Jitsu. What story is your website telling and how is it telling it? Are you just talking about yourself or are you connecting with your customers on a more meaningful level? Find out at brandjitsu.com slash redline. If you feel so inclined, you can support the show by like, share, and subscribe wherever you get your favorite podcast. Also, you can go to patreon.com slash rebel rebel pod. The Rebel Rebel is a show dedicated to creative rebels and entrepreneurs all over the world. It's for those people who think audaciously and act courageously in service of making the world a better and more interesting place. It rolls up to one distinct mission that I'm on, which is to help other people make what matters to their careers, to their companies, and their communities. We should care more about resonance to build our causes than reach. And I think the internet mostly drags us in the wrong direction. There, likewise, storytelling can be a way of operating. It's not something you acquire. You know, that there's a very big difference between learning story and being a storyteller. On this episode, meet Jay, a master storyteller and advocate for meaningful content over vanity metrics. Discover how Jay champions the art of resonance in a world obsessed with reach. Please welcome Jay Akunzo to the Rebel Rebel podcast. All right, welcome to the Rebel Rebel. I'm your host, Michael Dargy, and somewhere across the universe is Jay Akunzo. Jay, how the hell are you? I'm, I'm doing well. It's April 4th when we're recording this, and it's like sleeting and snowing outside here in the Boston area. So oh. I'm, I'm emotionally, it, it's, it's, a, it's been a roller coaster of a morning, Dargy. So <laughs> thanks for having me on the show. This, this is sure to brighten my day. Oh, good. Yeah, because <laughs> I, I woke up this morning. It was plus 17 Celsius yesterday, uh, and it is now minus 10 today. Oh, fun. Also sleeting and snowing. And uh, yeah, so I feel you. Yeah. Well, as uh, Radio Lab's Robert Krolwich famously said when he retired from the show, that this medium is like sitting around a warm fire with friends. Oh. Oh. There we go. We it need is. it. So true. Uh, well, uh, so welcome from Boston. And um, it, Jay, if you could catch us up on what's happening in Jay's world today. Yeah. And then we'll do some time travel. Yeah. So my my world splits uh, in a few different ways, <laughs> yes, which I can talk about, but it rolls up to one distinct mission that I'm on, which is to help other people make what matters to their careers, to their companies and their communities. And so uh, an assertion I like to make is that we as content creators, as business builders, as communicators and, and as rebels, we should care more about resonance to build our causes than reach. And I think the internet mostly drags us in the wrong direction. It drags us towards reach. It drags us towards empty followers and vanity metrics. It drags us towards sameness. And we're seeing that show up across social media in rampant form. So I am trying to provide a counterweight in all of my work, all of my projects, so that we get back to caring about resonance oh, because that's man. what the work is for, not, not reach. The reach part gets easier or you never have to think about it if you can resonate deeply with the right people. Oh man, I, I got chills. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like legit. Yeah. That, uh, wow. Thank you. Uh, that's awesome. I, I love that. Uh, resonance over reach. Because I, I do think that we spend way too much time worrying about, um, you know, how many followers we have or, yeah. you know, and that sort of thing. Vanity metrics. Wow. Um, if we go to, uh, let me just sort of flash over to your website for a sure. sec. Um, just because everybody wants to know. Everybody. Everybody, jayacunzo.com with an asterisk. What's with that asterisk? Oh, yeah. So the, the, <laughs> um, I'm very lucky to have a wonderful website. I worked with um, a firm called um, Free the Robot Creative oh, and right. um, many years ago. I, I don't think they're around anymore. But the, the logo that we jointly created was this custom typography with my name and then an asterisk. And what I love about the asterisk is... You know, as a storyteller, you learn how to speak with more tension. I always just thought I appreciated drama or was more dramatic than other people, yeah. like, growing up. Uh -huh. uh, or I saw the drama <laughs> in things in my life, and it could tell a story about that. Like, that's a useful skill. Is you, you, you imbue meaning into things that are ordinary yeah. as a storyteller. You don't have that. to experience anything crazy or exceptional or extraordinary. And so when you learn about storytelling, there's, there's a concept called the open loop, which is just planting a question on someone's mind and we are hardwired to then want the closure of that loop. And there's really, really big examples like Game of Thrones. Who will sit on the Iron Throne? It took 10 years of the show for them to answer that question, right? right. And, and the key here is you got to answer it in satisfactory fashion. But that's a podcast for another, another industry <laughs> niche. Um, yeah. So that's like a really big hit you over the head. Like who will sit on the throne, right? Um, that's why we're hardwired to love 
you know, tournaments, right? Right now it's the end of the March Madness tournaments for men's and women's college basketball here in the United States. And it's this giant open loop when you see the bracket and you see all the blank spaces heading towards a championship. We're hardwired to want closure in everything. And so the open loop as a storyteller is really, really useful. And there, uh, there's all these different types of open loops. I mentioned a couple really big ones just there. Yeah. I always thought that the tiniest one was the word but, right? So as a good storyteller, you you know, <laughs> this happened, then this happened, then this happened. But then that happened. Yeah. What will happen next? This. Right? Right. It's how you grip people. It's how you get the time you need to earn their trust and to resonate, right? To build yeah. a relationship. But it turns out there's actually an even tinier open loop which is the asterisk. And there's so much, and it's like a whole universe of possibility <laughs> and storytelling and relationships and resonance and oh, creativity that unfolds with that asterisk, both the thing itself as a, as a device, but yeah. also just a reminder to myself constantly that that's the business that I'm in. Oh. And, you know, and so I, I actually, if you go to the very bottom of my site, I answer that question in an essay, <laughs> what's with the asterisk? Because I think people do take it as, oh, it's an asterisk. I'm hardwired to like want to find out more. <laughs> right. And, and that's the point. Like the reach resonance thing, there's a corollary to that, which is like a lot of people are obsessed with grabbing attention sure. when the golden rule of storytelling is is to hold it, is to get them to the end. Right. And, and you, you start with, imagine I told you this story. <laughs> It's like the, the opening line of the. I just love this. I, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's just like a it's a way John Cleese of Monty Python fame has said about creativity. It's not a skill or a talent. It's a way of operating. Right. There, likewise, storytelling can be a way of operating. It's not something you acquire. You know that there's a very big difference between learning story and being a storyteller. Like learning story is to learn the techniques, the the checklist you move through. That's the process. That's that's helpful. But your yeah. process can also emerge from your practice when you're just routinely shipping. And your practice, because it involves you, necessarily brings with it your posture, like how you see yourself in the world. So those three things represent mastery. It's not just the process that we think we need. It's also the practice of routinely putting your butt in the chair and doing the work on deadline, no matter how you feel. And then it's the posture you bring with you, kind of this messy bag of humanity that you bring to everything you do. And some people willingly dip into that bag and some people want to ignore it or, or actively remove it. Right. So to be a storyteller is to see everything possibly as a story, right? And you press that through whatever premise you might be exploring. Like I like to explore that premise of resonance over reach. And, you know, an author has a premise for the book. A, a podcaster has a premise for the show. I think we need a premise for our overall platform. Mm -hmm. Some kind of defensible assertion you're making of, what should be, despite what currently is. And then if that's what you're thinking about, for me, resonance overreach, then everywhere I go, I'm thinking, oh, is that a thing? Maybe that's a thing, right? Yeah. It's kind of like the comedian finding story threads and oh, going, is this man. anything? Well, I got to go put it on stages and work it out. Right, but let me just that. save that to my notebook for now. So it's very much a way of seeing the world to be a storyteller and a way of practicing your craft, not just acquiring like a checklist of here's the the hero's journey or here's what an open loop is like right. useful, but incrementally. So not foundationally. Far out. Uh, wow. Okay. So thank you for that. And let me, uh, so how did, let me do some time travel here for a second, sure. because you did mention that as a young man, you were wired for drama. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm curious what that looks like sure. early days of, uh, Jay Akunzo. Give me the shape of that and how you got to here. Yeah. I mean, I was always performing, writing, creating little colored, colored, uh, you know, with my markers as a kid, little books based on my toys. <laughs> like I was always uh, performing mostly because I think I just wanted to be the center of attention, but also right. because, you know, when you're young and someone says, hey, you're good at this for me writing, you're, you're, you like feeling good. You like being complimented. And, and I think then you, you seek it out more. Like this is why good role models, good teachers, good parents, good support systems matter so much. It's like so much of creativity is the amount you've practiced and putting in those reps and finding yourself, not just kind of doing it in rote fashion. Yeah. That takes a lot of practice. And people who have more practice generally, or at least for me, I'll, I'll personalize this, it happened for me because people at a young age were like, hey, you're pretty good at this writing stuff. So that just caused me to seek it out more, you know, right. even though back then I, you know, was still figuring it out. So I was always making stuff 
and just hardwired to tinker. And I think when I turned 30, there's this famous film series at ESPN um, where I briefly had an internship in PR. Uh, and the film series is 30 for 30. They made 30 films on their 30th anniversary. I, what I realized is when I turned 30, I had created 30 side projects by 30 years old. So I had 30 <laughs> by 30. And they weren't day jobs. They weren't, you know, I'd worked in marketing at companies like Google and HubSpot and a tiny right. startup and a VC. And those were great. But the story of my career is really on the side. It's really trying to see, oh, there's something light and subtle, but full of tension about this moment I'm observing. And I could turn that into a story by like over dramatizing right. that, that tension, really. You know, I yeah. remember like being in college, taking creative nonfiction as a class and being assigned to write about something ordinary. And I picked a local diner and I, I went there and I sat there in the morning and I just like with my notebook was watching things unfold and I struggled for a bit. And then I realized, well, everybody here is kind of going through something, right? Yeah. The man with the brown bomber jacket on the stool trying to pay for his meal is grumbling about the news. And then the waitress shuffles over and the man sa the man tries to guess his amount that he owes. Yeah. And the woman says to him, like, you're off by five cents. And he curses and pays her and shuffles out the door. Like, I don't know what that is. I just know that that, that is something or right. could be, right? Yeah. And the difference is it's not just clubbing you over the head. It's not happening to you. And then you convey the transcript. Yeah. It's that there's, this, there's something there and then you, you experience it and then turn it into stories. Right. Right. And it, so it helps if you see the drama, see the tension, see the questions and curiosity, even subtly everywhere you go. I love that. That is, holy shit. I mean, it's, it's a hyperbolic metric or, or like, hmm, a, that's interesting. Right. To yeah. sort of, you know, push those boundaries to see where they break, you know, uh, where, where the truth stops, you know, maybe is a, is an interesting way to look at that. Um, well, that's why I loved creative nonfiction. Honestly, it's like, you're encouraged to do to tell true stories, but to include emotional stakes according to your lens on it. It's subjective. Yeah. Um, it's not this old and I think archaic notion. I just talked to a friend of mine who's a who's been a journalist and a writer for many years. Has worked for the Atlantic and has written books and stuff. And, and we were catching up about his latest book, and he was saying, "Yeah, the difference between writing this book of his." And being a reporter was there was this notion in journalism that you are a vessel for the objective truth, right. which is a really, I and he said this, not me, an outmoded way of thinking about journalists because they're encouraged to act more like kind of fact gathering robots than right. fully formed humans. And it sort of also ignores the fact that inevitably some part of the work will be influenced by the fact that you wrote it instead of me. Sure. And so taking that out of journalism now, you think about what's happening online and you think about what's happening with most of the world of content creators, mm -hmm. marketers, business builders, the world I occupy. I'm not so worried about bots replacing humans. I'm much more worried about all these humans who are acting like bots. Wow. Because they're just doing these rote things or they're doing things that others tell them work or that algorithms incentivize them to do. And the result is you, you ignore the fact that inevitably – inevitably, without you thinking about it, you will influence this work somehow. Right. And I think that if you would like to evolve, if you'd like to compete on the impact of your ideas, not just like the volume of your content, you should be proactive. Instead of just letting it happen, you should carefully consider how am I influencing this work? What is my perspective on this? How do I work and rework my articulation of that perspective? Again, like a comedian might on small stages or an yeah. author might... Um, you know, publishing online to test material more than distribute what they know, then I can use that perspective to find better ideas, my own unique spin on something, stories that just don't look like anything that newsworthy in my life, but they're somehow noteworthy to me now. Like yeah. you give yourself this lens through which you see the world when you have what I call the, the premise behind your work. And it allows your humanity to come out a little bit more proactively instead of just leaving it to chance. And, and that's what separates you from all the bot-driven BS out there. Love that. I, and I love the the phrase raising the stakes too. Um, yeah. We we see that. Uh, so Loose Moose Theater is an improvisational theater in Calgary. It's one of the founding places of improv 
around the world. Great name. Great yeah. name. <laughs> Loose Moose. Loose, Loose Moose, Moose Theater. Awesome. Yeah. Lose news. Uh, but we talk about raising the stakes all the time on stage because we are we get so worried about taking chances and you know uh, being altered when on stage. Mm. But as soon as you raise those stakes and you become altered, that's when things get interesting. Yeah, I love that. And I, I've been a professional speaker three years in a row. In fact, that was my main source of income. Wow. It's still something I do quite a bit virtually and in person. But but keynote speaking is just a craft I've fallen in love with. That's why yeah. you've heard me mention comedians so many yeah. times already because I've yeah. learned so much from those people oh, yeah. and how they approach the craft. But I do – I love that translation work of like how do you take yourself as a person and basically become a feature, uh, a piece you control almost – yeah. As you like externalize yourself onto the stage, right? right. And like it's, it's an amped up version or a contextualized version of you. It mm -hmm. is still you, but it's you trying to deliver the best version of you for that context, that content you're delivering, that moment in time, that specific stage or room, that medium overall that is speaking yeah. versus here on this podcast, right? You know, I have, I have some signature bits in my speech that I know if I delivered them exactly as I do on a stage here today. Yeah, that it wouldn't work. Sure. Um, and you see, again, you see this from comedians who appear on late night shows. They recount some of their bits from the special, but they modulate their voice. They shorten sure. the delivery. They change up how they seek the laugh. They almost chuckle to themselves to give the room permission to laugh, too, because right. the room, while they're ready to laugh, they're not so heightened as to seek out laughter, like at a comedy show, right? Right. Where, like, everything seems funnier because of where you're at. So there's all these, like, subtleties about this work we do that you can just characterize as as the craft, right? It's, like, all these things that, that you're sort of, like, only going to learn through practice. Yeah. Um, you're not going to learn through some guru giving you, like, a checklist. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Putting, putting anything up on stage is a great way to, <laughs> to, to test it. There, there I, is no greater way to vet an idea or yeah. a skill or a bit or a story than like I am putting it on. Like Seinfeld said this. He gets five minutes every act to be every show to just yeah. be Seinfeld because yeah. people have challenged him. Like it's not so democratized when you're Jerry Seinfeld. They sure. love you. And he goes, yeah, but after a few minutes, they have to love the material. <laughs> yeah. They have, they can't just, I can't just be Seinfeld. I have to deliver. Yeah. And you know, that's a little bit different online. You see a lot of people who just like get a bunch of following and you yeah. know, get, they play to the algorithm or people just love them because of who they are. But in that room, in the auditorium, the theater, in the conference room, when you're, when you're standing up to give a presentation, you have to deliver the goods. There is yeah. no other place for you to go than to delight the audience somehow. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Um, Talk to me about Creator Kitchen because sure. I I feel that this is uh, a, it's a it's adjacent uh, but in alignment. Um, yeah, right. So I I earn a living three ways. Speaking yeah. is actually receded to number three because I have two okay. little kids at home and I, yeah. I desperately don't want to leave them. But for a while that was pretty prevalent in my career. And then the other two ways are I I consult uh, creators, entrepreneurs, small business owners, people that have been creating content online for a time, mm -hmm. but they're struggling to stand out. And they're, they're, they're maybe feeling pulled towards these grimy gimmicks we see from people, or they don't feel that temptation at all, but don't know what else to do because that's, quote, what works on the internet. Yeah, right. But there's another path, which is, you know, the problem is not your content or your stories. The problem is you don't have strong enough IP. You don't have a distinct premise that colors all your work and your reputation that you become known for. You don't use that premise to develop your website's positioning, to develop projects, to you know go to market, go on podcasts and, and be able to communicate clearly what you're about. That's the problem. So I'll work one-to-one -one with clients to help develop their, their premise, their signature stories, and their overall IP for their work. Because I really want to equip people with substance yeah. to stand out, um, not just people with empty hype that like play to these trendy gimmicks. Um, and so the kitchen is an extension of that. It's a membership community. So we have at, at its core, uh, we have 68 members now who are all fairly experienced, like 10, 15, 20 years of experience. Um, and they are similarly experts in their domain, but mm -hmm. they're looking to level up on their creative craft when it comes to their stories, their content, how they differentiate, how they explain themselves or inspire action from others. 
And so we, we go through periods that we call because it's the kitchen and we're creative people. Everything is a kitchen pun. Like sometimes <laughs> to our detriment, we have menus and menus are let's group together a master class and some resources around different creative skills like yeah. personal storytelling, public speaking. Um, how do you model your ideas into a visual framework? We're talking about doing interview skills, like on a podcast, how do you interview well? All these th things that transfer with you everywhere you go. Nice. It's not how to arbitrage this algorithm on LinkedIn to grow a following. It's not that. Mm. It's everywhere Good. you go, this skill goes with you. They're transferable. So that's what we believe in. We believe in taking experts and helping them become more influential voices, not by giving them these cheap tricks, but by helping them master the creative craft in different ways. Um, and really the, the core of it is wrestling with your ideas. It's a lot of small group coaching, roundtables, office hours, that kind of thing to complement yeah. any programming that we offer. Far out. What, you're, you mentioned um, it, there's so many things to unpack on that. Sure. And I, I, would, I would just actually direct people to your site to dive into yeah, that. I, I've got up on this screen here, like building a strong talk proposal is one of these uh, Google Docs that I'm seeing. And it just makes it so simple to break it down into what's important because, you know, I, as a writer and as a presenter and speaker myself, I know how difficult it is to organize these thoughts. I want to say so much, but how do I narrow that down and make it relevant to the audience that I'm speaking to? So I love this. Yeah. Th yeah. Thank you for that. And that's free right there. I could just grab it. I have it right there. So thanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some of the resources are free. And then the bulk of the, the membership is really, it's a paid membership. Yeah. You can subscribe every quarter or every, or every year. Yeah. Um, and that's where you access myself, my co-founder, Melanie. Yeah. Um, she came out of the New York Times and Time Inc. and places like that. Love it. And uh, we do a lot of interactive wrestling with ideas and drafts and, you know, existential crises all the way down <laughs> to like tiny techniques. It's a lot of catharsis, as you'd imagine, because yeah. like we're all creative in some way. So yeah. there's a lot of that. Uh, but what we all have in common is like we really care about the quality and the craft elements of this work. Uh, we're not just trying to like find clever ways to like take a podcast episode and make 17 tiny clips from the podcast right. episode and call that good marketing. Like that's right. not who these who these people are, which is great. Oh, I love that you are fighting for that. That you're that you're fighting for relevance. I, like that hits me deep in my soul. Um, and I think one of the reasons why I reached out and I'm just like, I really want to have you on the show because we just don't hear enough of that these days. Um, so appreciate that. So you, speaking is number three. Um, yep. you know, the creator kitchen is number one or two. What's the other right. leg of the stool? Well, I mentioned the one-to-one -one client services. That's really oh, okay. the bulk of my, my business, but that gotcha. is connected. You know, if, if I do one-to-one, -one, almost like the white glove services with yeah. individual entrepreneurs, clients, and creators. Um, then small group coaching is the kitchen. So those are, those are connected in many ways. Um, they rely on similar frameworks and methodologies and all that good stuff. Um, but then I also have sponsorships. So I host a podcast called How Stories Happen, right, which yeah. actually I am launching at the end of April with the trailer is live. But you can think of it as Song Exploder in music or Good One in comedy, but for our work as storytellers, where every episode we get an expert, a creator, some kind of communicator, and they bring a signature story or a new draft, and we dissect it together piece by piece. Wow. So we kind of trace, how did you find this story? How did you develop it? What did we notice upon you telling it? How might it improve? And then how are you using it everywhere you go um, publicly to promote your cause and build your audience and, and kind of you know leave your legacy, frankly? Wow. Yeah, so that's how stories happen, which I'm really, really excited about. It's my, my second show. I hosted a show for many years called Unthinkable from like yeah. 2016 to the beginning of this year. And it, it was it was time time for a new chapter, so I'm really <laughs> excited about this new show. Oh, that's so great. I'm, I'm jumping in with with both feet. Um, talk to me about Boston. Have you been there forever? Uh, no, I, I, well, I grew up in southern Connecticut, which okay. I, I if you're in the United States, even if you're local – doesn't really have an identity. So like no big deal if you listening or watching this is like, what is Connecticut like? Or where even is it? I get it. It's a really tiny state in between New York and Massachusetts. So it's like, I refer to it as New York, Massachusetts. That's Connecticut. Uh, half my friends were Red Sox fans. Half my friends, including me, Yankees fans. Uh, I'm also a Knicks fan. So I endear myself to people because they feel bad for me. Although lately, yeah. oh, we're pretty nice. good. Lately, we're good. Uh, but I, I got a job at Google in uh, 2008 after college. 
and that took me to Boston. And so with the exception of two years in the middle, I've been in the Boston area um, my whole adult life, mostly working in software and tech when I was in-house. And then since transitioning out independently in 2016, I've been doing the things you've you've heard me uh, describe so far. Love it. I, I, and I was just going to say, you don't have that quintessential Boston drawl. Um, no. Are you a co-op? A what? Are you a co-op? You're, no. is, your, is your father oh, co-op? a co-op? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all I got. I can't do anything more. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, <laughs> uh, so l- l- let me ask this question. Um, if you're walking down the street in Boston... And I don't know what your typical day looks like. I, I know that you've got some some small kids you look after and uh, enjoy. You've got some family life, but let's just say it's just Jay, and it's the you know early morning, and the I don't know the you're walking down the street. You're off to get a coffee. What is the one thing that you're thinking about as you're walking to that coffee? And you're just like, oh man, I really wish the world knew this thing. What is that thing that you wish the world knew? Yeah. There's this paradox of storytelling that sums it up really well, which is, you know, we all want our work to be beloved and we all want to connect to the right people to serve our cause. Now that might mean I'm building an audience online and I'm selling services or selling products or I have sponsorships, you know, all the things, similar things to what I do. That might mean you're trying to rally people to, somehow uh, spark action for a community cause, funding for your local schools, not tearing down that, uh, that old monument or whatever. We all have causes that require us to communicate. And typically what we end up doing is trying to demand that others care, demand that they act. But really effective storytellers, and I use the word carefully, effective storytellers, not just good storytellers. Effective yeah. storytellers understand that It's possible to inspire action. It's possible to inspire others to care. But you have to connect on the emotional stakes. And mostly the way we communicate, especially as things get higher stakes for some reason, is we forget the emotional stakes needed to make others care. We go fact, 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 report, 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 data, 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 do this, do this, do this, command, command, command. So there's this paradox of storytelling, which is actually if you want to connect deeper externally, you have to turn deeper internally. You have to find the emotional stakes. So you should be able to tell a story about anything, your morning coffee routine, Mm -hmm. the craziest thing that's ever happened to you and everything in between. And that topic or that action has no bearing on what you're talking about. You know, I I do this all the time. I'm teaching people marketing, teaching people storytelling, teaching people how to create content. And I'm using stories about raising kids, about making my coffee, about being a Knicks fan. Mm -hmm. And the person on the receiving end would easily go, I don't care about or experience any of those things. And I'm like, yeah, exactly. Like you don't experience uh, the spider powers of Spider-Man either. Yet why does he connect so much with so much influence? Because with great power comes great responsibility, right? right? Uh, I loved Ted Lasso. I don't care about football. I right. do love the story of someone trying to remain kind and virtuous as life throws hardships your way and you evolve. Yeah. Um, I don't read him, but Stephen King has raving fans. Carrie is not really about Carrie. It's about the feelings of isolation that we can all relate to. So when you see communication designed to spur some kind of action in the world for a business or a cause, typically it's void of emotional stakes. And that's because the communicator themselves has failed to go deep enough internally to find those emotional stakes as they felt it. Um, There's a perfect quote to sum this up. It's from the author Kazuo Ishiguro. It's my favorite quote on storytelling. So Ishiguro has written tons of novels and won the Nobel Prize in Literature in 2017. And he says that stories are like one person saying to another, this is how it feels to me. Can you understand what I'm saying? Does it also feel this way to you? So storytellers who are effective, they communicate with clarity, but they also connect on that emotional meaning of it all. And there's this wonderful little phrase that I would encourage people to remember to do this. Because it's like, well, how do I do this? Do I have to become like a mindful person and have like a meditation practice? And, <laughs> yeah, If that works for you, fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Or do I have to like clear my schedule to like navel gaze and like get right. emotional? Like, no, I'm not asking you to be vulnerable. There's this wonderful phrase. You can kind of see versions of this or this exact phrase among the most effective storytellers. Often it's implied. But usually there's like this pivot point where people go, hey, so this happened. It's a memory or a moment. And that made me realize something. It was an idea sparked by that memory or moment. And then they say, 
And that's the thing about, right? Like that's the thing about this topic that you care about, audience. Right. This lesson or insight I have for you now. So like a really easy example. Let's take one that requires no resources, no mastery at a crazy cosmic level of being an amazing documentarian or filmmaker or narrative storyteller. Let's go back to the coffee example. Like imagine I wanted to teach you to try new things. And that was my message. Yeah. One way I could say it, and this is how most communicate, is in general, studies show that human beings are not afraid of the thing they're facing. They're not afraid of the task itself. They're afraid, you're afraid of the unknown. And so I become the Nike slogan and I go, so just do it. Right. Ineffective. And even if it's valuable, everyone can say it that way. I have sure. no relationship with you. I'm not inspired to care or act. Yeah. Or I could say, and I'll use those three beats arriving at that key phrase. So this happened. So um, I have an espresso maker in my kitchen and for years was afraid to make espresso. This is an actual true story. I'm Italian, <laughs> which anyone watching this can tell from everything about me. <laughs> With the gel and the hands and the volume. Yeah. yeah. Um, and my wife is not Italian, but she makes it all the time. And I would ask her or I would follow espresso like influencers or I would like <laughs> debate taking a course in home espresso making and I wouldn't do it or I'd outsource it or I'd like agonize over the research, right? Sound, sound familiar? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but now I make it every day, every day. And the only thing that changed was I made it once. So right. let's just step out of the story. This happened. It's just like a personal memory or a moment. That's sure. it. Next, next phase of the story, which made me realize, right? So, oh, wow, I really wasted a lot of time agonizing, outsourcing, not doing it. Yeah. Because it's not that hard to make espresso. And by the way, when I messed up, I could either fix it myself or now my research became focused and not wasteful. Right. Uh, and that's <laughs> the thing about – here's that next phrase. That's the thing about trying new things. If what we're really afraid of is not the task but the unknown, then we should move faster to make the unknown known. Studies show this too. Don't yeah. agonize over the research or doing it or waste a bunch of time following the experts or outsourcing it or sit on your hands. Just try the thing once and then right. proceed with, with clarity and confidence from there, right? So like I didn't – what did I talk about? Ultimately, a giant, juicy, nothing burger of an event in my life. <laughs> nothing happened. I made coffee. <laughs> what could be more mundane than that? You but overcame though. That's the story. That's the emotional stakes. Yeah. Everyone is going, even if you don't know espresso, let's say that's a possibility in someone listening. They sure. don't even know what espresso is. It doesn't matter, right? Yeah. Like, or let's say, well, Jay, you're here at a marketing conference or a creator conference. Why are you talking about making coffee when we're all business minds? Like you're supposed to be talking about business related things or trying new things. I thought you were teaching yeah. me that. Why are you talking about coffee, right? Well, that's the thing about Right. right. So that's an it's a pivot point between being a good storyteller that can grip you yeah. to being an effective storyteller which can move you. Love it. Damn. Knowledge bombs from Jay. <laughs> <laughs> holy holy hell. What uh, let's just let's go here for a second. What's the what's a thing that you do just for Jay? Like what's what's Jay's guilty pleasure, the thing that just fills your bucket? I used to know, my friend. I used to know, right? I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old. <laughs> uh, they talk about loss of identity among parents of little kids. Yeah. I don't know what they talk about about parents of little kids that just went through a global pandemic, but it's even oh. worse. Mm -hmm. um, I am rediscovering that. You know, I'm rediscovering that, hey, you know, I really like basketball, both playing and watching it. Yeah. Um, you know, I really, really love just tinkering on silly side projects for fun that I used to do in the mornings and at night and on weekends, all time claimed by trying to sneak in an extra wink of sleep or kids, right? So there's not really room in my life right now for anything that is not parenting, work, and once in a while having a relationship with adults that I love. Mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> in calmer days, yeah. I am a huge basketball fan. I love to cook and I love to sort of just do a thing that feels silly and fun, you know, design a logo for a dream project or uh, my daughter who's five, she loves the spotlight. Can't imagine where she got that from. Uh, okay. And um, we have a little, like a little private podcast we do together and she'll ask me to do it. It's oh super fun. We just like randomly pick a topic and we talk about it and I ask her questions and she sings and it's wonderful. <laughs> and I, and I've, I, I've listened to a few. I've done this since she was two. And yeah. there's something about the intimacy of audio that we have all these videos of her 
but that hits me more emotionally this this audio only yeah. version of her um so i'm really excited and i'm probably going to make it into a project i share with my family someday so like that's the kind of thing i love to do but oh, but in man. truth the stuff that fills my cup i'm very very lucky in this regard is the day-to-day work it is the nine to five work that i control excuse me yeah. control i'm getting choked up about it <laughs> <laughs> or just choking because I'm, I'm dried out because i have a toddler cold <laughs> well but that's that's what dish. fills my cup yeah i right, love it right uh, oh man so uh, my kids are much older and one of the things i remember being a, a parent of young children is story time and i don't know if you do that but that was my favorite time of day would be like the wind down jump into bed grab a book like dr seuss hop on pop whatever and just you know hitting cat in the hat hard uh, <laughs> you know, in all the fun ways that you can do with kids. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, that's, that's, I love those moments. And yeah. It, we're, we're all very silly. I mean, honestly, I, I said what fills my cup for work. What yeah. genuinely fills my cup is just being goofy and weird and silly <laughs> and creative yeah. uh, with my kids. I have an older daughter and a younger son and the two of us together or three of us together, you know, we play characters, we oh, tell stories, it. we read books, yeah. uh, you know, we paint and, sculpt things and yeah like that's the best is to remember that the point of being alive is to actually like live and experience yeah. the world and see it in the moment like kids are the great at least in my life the great unlock for like it forces you to be mindful and oh, yeah. sometimes i rebel and i grumble about that and i want to say this is all butterflies and rainbows because it's freaking impossible to yeah. raise little kids and also then have a career <laughs> you care about it's freaking impossible yeah. uh, but in in other moments of my life, I'm able to see it for what it is, which is this complete unlock for I am mindful. I see the world through their eyes of like I have a sense of wonder. Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, if I can't get there naturally during a given day because I'm thinking about work, then I can steer into that and go, Jay, be mindful. Right. See the world with their eyes and have a sense of wonder at it because that's going to make you a better storyteller. Oh, yeah. What's the worst slash best thing that your daughter has ever made for you that you've had to eat oh that's interesting <laughs> i'm lucky there isn't actually anything she so because she loves to cook with us okay. so she's got a little bib and the step stool <laughs> and all that stuff but she's she's the sous chef she likes to chop things up and nice and do all that stuff yeah, yeah yeah i've been very lucky i have not had to eat anything that she prepared for me but make no mistake if she put a bunch of slop in front of me that looked like it had <laughs> lint and bugs in it I am eating that like it's a, a three-star restaurant, my friend. Yes, yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> Outstanding. Uh, I, and I, I do take the point that there's not a lot of time when you're raising two kids and running a business and ha trying to have a life. But is, is there uh, are there books on your shelf that you try to get to, um, or that I, I mean, I, you have your mm. own books clearly, but yeah, yeah. Um, what do you read? Yeah, yeah. I've written a couple, um, and I aspire to do a lot more. I, I, I mostly don't read books about work. Um, I really like creative nonfiction. You know, nice. like my favorite storyteller of all time is Anthony Bourdain. And if anyone has followed <sighs> me around the internet, they've just heard me mention him more than any other name um, yeah. of people I admire. Um, I've also read like Mike Birbiglia is my favorite comedian, autobiographical storyteller. He has yeah. like narrative arcs to his whole act. I love that. He shares openly on his podcast how he talks about this stuff and thinks about it and executes it. There's a new documentary on Peacock about Birbiglia's approach to his next act. I love wow. that stuff. He had a book called The New One that I really enjoyed. Um, but yeah, Bourdain to me is the sort of like person that opened my eyes to a colloquial style of writing about very meaningful things, um, along with honestly some of the sports writers that I used to admire. Yeah. Jim Murray, um, Rick Riley, for a moment in time, Bill Simmons. You know, he tipped towards podcasts and away from writing, but there was this sort of movement and Jim Murray predates the other two, but where you can kind of, and I have this about me too, when I write, especially like I'm, I'm pretty voicey, like it's, it, 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 I use parenthetical sides <laughs> and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and it's from those days of reading works that felt like, Hey, this is a microcosm of all the meaning of the human experience, sports, business, Great. food. Love it. Oh man. Uh, okay, well, I'm going to put links to all those in the show notes. Thank you. And uh, as well as your books as well. Um, and this has been so much fun, Jay. I, like, I think I'm I'm going to check out your 
your mastermind. But that that's for that's for a different thing. Um, imagine, if you will, that there's these people. Uh, and maybe they have a unique perspective. Maybe they're just trying to, and it doesn't matter whether they're just new to speaking or new to, uh, you know, taking this step out into the world. We call them rebels in waiting. And they're just like, there's these, there's just this bit of energy behind them, but they just don't quite have enough to get over the edge. Yeah. Um, sometimes I, I liken it to Wiley Coyote stepping off the edge, looking down and realizing that there's nothing there. And it's that moment just before they fall or have the uh-oh sign, what advice would you give to these rebels in waiting for how to move forward? You need to be able to look yourself in the eye and others you're trying to serve and be able to message to yourself or others where they can find your work and at what cadence. This is a long way of saying you need a creative practice. I don't know how many times people are like, I have all this work inside me. I have all these stories and ideas and things. And I go, tell me about your creative practice. And they look at me like I have three heads, right? And I'm like, okay, let, let, let me tell you about mine. Every other Friday, and it started for many years as every Friday, but I, you know, I'm at the point now where I don't need to do as much volume. Yeah. But every week for years, I wrote a newsletter, mostly to no one. I wrote a blog, mostly to no one. And I would ship that on Friday mornings. Why? Because that was my day to ship. Not because I feel good, not because I'm inspired. I joke that I, I like take a mean girls approach. If anyone's familiar with the film Mean Girls, like on Wednesdays, we wear pink. Why? Because it's Wednesday. Why am I <laughs> shipping on Friday? Because it's Friday. Not because it's the best thing I ever did, or I yeah. feel great, or the news made me happy. It's because it's Friday. Like if you had a ticket to a train to get to a work meeting at 8 a.m. tomorrow, no matter what's going on in your life or your day, you'd be on that train. Like, that's how you have to treat the work. All of this is practiced. It's not just going to happen. And I also hate the people that are like, well, just muscle through. No, like in the quiet, when you feel like you have nothing to give, the only thing you can do is put something on the page and hit publish. That's fine. It gets you to the next step and the next step. And the next step. So I like to say that, you know, you have all these creative heroes you admire, all these rebels, if you will. They sure. are like, oh, if only I could do something like them. I wish we had like an alien technology gifted to us where you could scan your creative heroes and understand the caliber of their entire body of work. Because yeah. all we get are the greatest hits. All we get are sure. the eighth version of that thing, right? All that alien technology would reveal to us is like, oh, we put all these people up on a pedestal, but that pedestal is actually made of crappy work. Sure. So go make crappy work over and over and over on a deadline, no matter what. You will not be able to resist the urge or prevent yourself from eventually creating work that is all your own and that others appreciate too. Oh, Jay. Holy shit. Thank you so much for that. Sure. Sure. You have the intention for quality. Keep yeah. that. Now go create quantity on a deadline. That's it. You have good intentions. Don't don't get rid of that. Don't willingly be like, I don't care about any good <laughs> things. I don't care about you or about my quality. No, that's not what I'm saying. Yeah. That is not what I'm saying. Hold dear to your desire to create something special, but know that the path there is going to look like a lot of messing around. But that's actually where you find all the best stuff. That's where you find yourself. That's where you find your best ideas. That's where your audience finds you and develops a relationship to you. It happens in the making of the mess. So, so go make a mess. Love it. Oh, and... On that note, uh, all the stuff in the show notes, jayacunzo.com, your new podcast, we'll put that all there, your books. Jay, this has been just time well spent. Thank you so much for being so generous with it. Thank you. This was super fun. I love what you're doing in the world. Please keep at it and your audience is better for it. Thanks, Jay. Thank you so much for listening. I've been your host, Michael Dargy, and this has been the Rebel Rebel Podcast. It's a podcast for creative rebels and entrepreneurs all over the world. And hey, if you're a rebel or you know a rebel, why don't you head on over to therebelrebelpodcast.com and fill out our guest request form. We'll get back to you within 24 hours and maybe we can share your story with the world. Don't forget to like, share, or subscribe wherever you get your favorite podcasts. And thanks so much for listening. Until next time.